Well, good uh, morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service. Again at uh, Stone Market Baptist Church. I'm going to start with uh, one verse from the Word of God found in Isaiah. Isaiah 29 verse 14 says, Therefore, behold, I will again do a marvellous work among this people, a marvellous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Well, so reads the perfect word of God, and uh, this morning again I'm doing what I've done last week. I'm going to read three hymns that are not found in our hymn books. And the first one is by Frederick Whitfield. And it's entitled, I Saw the Cross of Jesus. I saw the cross of Jesus when burdened with my sin. I sought the cross of Jesus to give me peace within. I brought my soul to Jesus. He cleansed it in his blood. And in the cross of Jesus, I found my peace with God. I love the cross of Jesus. It tells me what I am. A vile and guilty creature, saved only through the Lamb. No righteousness, no merit, no beauty I can plead. Yet in the cross of glory, my title there I read. I clasp the cross of Jesus in every trying hour. My sure and certain refuge, my never failing tower. In every fear and conflict. I more than conqueror am, living I'm safe, or dying, through Christ the risen Lamb. Sweet is the cross of Jesus, there let my weary heart still rest in peace unshaken, till with him near to part. And then in strains of glory I'll sing his wondrous power, where sin can never enter, and death is known no more. Well, that lovely old hymn. We're now going to come to the Lord in prayer and uh, again would encourage you to bow your heads and your hearts to come reverentially, humbly to the throne of grace. Let us all pray. Let us pray. Almighty, everlasting God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, come to thee there is no other we come to the one true god the great creator god the one who is so much greater than our imaginations can ever begin to attain to the one who is all glorious all knowing all powerful come to the one who looked upon his creation, this world, and saw its sinfulness, its fallenness, and who had mercy. The one who so loved this world that you sent your only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who was born of the Virgin, the one who lived that perfect, sinless life. The one who truly was without sin. The one who freely walked to the cross. The one who was nailed to the cross. The one who said not a word in his defence. The Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, took on the sins of all who have put their faith and trust in him. Oh, dear Father in heaven, dear Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the, the triune God, we worship thee. We thank thee. We thank you, uh, you Father, that Jesus Christ done all of this and, and cried out from the cross, it is finished. And then gave up his spirit. Oh, dear Father, we thank you also that 
although Jesus died and, and was put in the grave, that on the third day he rose again. Triumphant over death. Triumphant over Satan. Triumphant over all evil. Triumphant to lead his elect into glory. And we now thank you, Father, that Jesus ascended and is now at your right hand, making intercession for us. So, Father, we pray for your help here this morning. We pray that uh, anyone who is going through difficult times, and we know that there are some in our congregation that are going through testing times that uh, may be through advanced years and failing health, uh, struggling. Lord, would you be with them? We pray for those that maybe are, are feeling spiritually weak and uh, far from God. Lord, may you assure them that you are not far from them. Pray for those that are finding life just very difficult. Looking round the world sees the, the cruelty and the evilness of man. Lord, would you reassure them that they are never alone. You are with them and your plan is working out. That one day all things will be made right. Every knee will bow to Christ. Our Father God, will you help us as we look into your word. And for anyone that uh, is maybe tuning in for the first time or maybe just out of interest as as visited the, uh, the site a, a couple of times they're not saved but they're interested Lord would you save them would they cry out to Jesus save me a sinner we pray this we pray this for our members of our own family we pray this for our neighbours our friends we pray this for, for the town of Stowe Market and the outlying villages that men and women, boys and girls, will turn to the only saviour there is. That they will, as it were, turn a complete uh, different direction. Will step off that broad road that leads to destruction. Onto the narrow way that leads to glory. So Lord, we ask great things. But you are a great and awesome God. So hear our prayers, Father, we ask. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to now turn to our reading. Uh, I overlap uh, in our reading one that I done a few weeks ago. Uh, so it's found in 1 Corinthians, uh, starting at verse 18. 1 Corinthians, verse 18, through to 2 Corinthians, verse 5. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since... In the wisdom of God, the world, through wisdom, did not know God. It pleased God, through the foolishness, foolishness of the message preached, to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. 
and the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen and the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are that no flesh should glory in his presence but of him you are in Christ Jesus who become for us wisdom from God and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, that, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, so reads the perfect word of our God. I want to just now read our second hymn and uh, this is by Isaac Watts and it's entitled But Few Among the Carnal Wise But few among the carnal wise but few of noble race obtain the favour of thine eyes almighty king of grace he takes the men of meanest name for sons and heirs of God, and thus he pours abundant shame on honourable blood. He calls the fool and makes him know the mysteries of his grace, to bring aspiring wisdom low and all its pride abase. Nature has all its glories lost when brought before his throne. No flesh shall in his presence boast, but in the Lord alone. So to our reading, Paul in this passage is addressing those in the church at Corinth who are claiming to be wise. In fact, he is addressing all in the church of Jesus Christ that are proud of their worldly wisdom. Now at Corinth they were not only proud of their worldly wisdom, they were actually using their worldly wisdom to divide the church and, and, and really to promote personalities and uh, probably their own. But the Apostle Paul is demonstrating them, to them and, and actually to all of Christ's church that with regards to the salvation of souls, such worldly wisdom, such worldly human wisdom is of no value to God because it cannot save a single soul and it cannot build the church of Jesus Christ. In fact, the wisdom that they are purporting to have does the opposite. It tears down things and as it upsets this church in Corinth, it brings in division. But it is even more sinister than that because it actually opposes the doctrine and fundamentals of the gospel of God's grace that is found in Christ so Paul is saying that to adhere to such worldly humanistic wisdom is in essence to oppose God it is the antithesis of everything that the gospel is and the gospel of Jesus Christ stands for Paul was telling them from the outset, human wisdom, the wisdom that they are priding themselves in having, is really based on human arrogance and it leads ultimately to destruction. Whereas, true wisdom, the wisdom of God, is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ, revealed from heaven, and it is this gospel, this gospel, that is the only thing that ultimately leads anyone to eternal life. In verse 17, Paul tells us categorically 
For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. In other words, don't miss this point, because the most important thing of all that I will preach is the cross of Christ. And if you miss that, well, then you will miss the wisdom of God. So Paul is warning all Christians of all times, do not allow human wisdom, human eloquence, to ever come in and obscure the power of the cross of Christ. Make sure that that you have the power of the cross of Christ. Make sure you have the wisdom of God. Make sure you have the wisdom of God and not the wisdom of man. Even theological wisdom of man because there is a fundamental difference and I want to highlight that difference this morning using three significant opposites found in our reading so these are the three firstly the gospel message is the opposite of worldly wisdom verses 18 to 25 secondly the gospel The gospel's grace is the opposite of worldly pride, verses 26 to 31. And thirdly, the gospel's power is the opposite of worldly persuasion, chapter 2 and those first five verses. So, the first difference. The gospel message is the opposite of worldly wisdom. In all of the diversity of this planet, there are ultimately only two types of people on it. Those in Christ and those not. Those that are being saved and those that are perishing. Those on the narrow way to glory, to heaven, and those on the broad road that leads to destruction, leads to hell. Paul tells us in verse 18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those that are perishing, but to us, that is every Christian, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So, two types of people with entirely opposed positions. And this is all because they have two completely different responses to the gospel of Jesus Christ on the cross. So this is the the demarcation line, if you like. Is the message of the cross, is it foolishness to you, or is it the power of God to save you? And your answer to that will decide which side you're on. Your answer to that will decide, are you among those that are perishing or those who are being saved? For those that are perishing, the idea of being saved through the work of a, of a crucified man, well, it's utter foolishness. It is something that their human wisdom will not accept. So if that is your position this morning then you must know, and God's word clearly tells you, you are perishing. But to those of us who the Bible says the Spirit of God is working in, to those of us who have put our faith, our our trust in Jesus, our whole perspective of what wisdom is has now been radically changed. The Spirit of God has wrought a work in our heart and our mind. And so that our spiritual eyes, well, we no longer see the cross as foolishness, and that's how I used to view it. But now we see the cross as the power of God unto salvation. And this miraculous change, which can only be made by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, 
Well, it is the greatest change. It is the greatest transformation known in creation. It truly is death to life. And I pray that all of us who are listening here this morning, or maybe will listen at some point in the future, will either know this translation, I, I pray that we all know this translation, or that, that some of you who don't know it currently will come to know this incredible, miraculous transformation from death to life. The Apostle Paul is making the point that the wisdom of this world is diametrically opposed to the only ma message that can save it. Now I suspect we all know that much of the world scoffs at this message, the cross of Jesus Christ. Maybe we've even uh, been challenged and, and, and laughed at when we've said we are saved by the cross of Jesus Christ. But a far greater concern, and, 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 and what you might not be aware of, is that there are parts today of the Christian church that also scoff at this message. And Paul is appealing to the Corinthians upon the grounds of the message that they had believed. The good news that, that had saved them. The good news that had placed them in the church of Jesus Christ and, and, and set them on this narrow way to glory. To support that claim, Paul quotes in verse 19 of our reading, the Old Testament uh, uh, reading of Isaiah 29, 14. That was the reading I started the service with. And uh, Paul quotes it in verse 19, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Paul is quoting how Isaiah was speaking to the Israelites of old. You see, whenever they were in trouble, when they were facing judgment and uh, wrath from other nations, what did they do? Well, sadly, they failed in this way as well. Rather than looking to God in faith for help, they very often foolishly looked to their own worldly wisdom. So in verse 20, Paul asks, these questions. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So Paul is showing that in spiritual matters, God opposes the wisdom of man. In fact, he will destroy the wisdom of the wise. God will not bow down before it. Paul is saying, in light of what God says in Isaiah 29, 14, where is your wise men? Where is your scribes? Where is the disputer of this age? God has made them all foolish through his wisdom. He has destroyed the wisdom of the wise, just as he said he would. Remember Pharaoh and Pharaoh's magicians before Moses. They thought that they could reciprocate the great wisdom of, of the God of Israel. Remember the Assyrians, Assyrians and, and their great arrogance in thinking that uh, they could outwit the God of Israel. Well, the bottom line is that the world, through wisdom, did not know God. There is a, a constant tendency to think that the, the smartest and, and the wisest human beings, well, they're the ones who know most about God. But you see, God cannot be found through human wisdom. Only through the message of the cross. The pursuit of human wisdom, well, it, it may bring an, an earthly contentment or, 
or a degree of happiness for a while, but in itself, it can never bring the true knowledge of the true, the one true God. In general, the, the high learning of mankind, well, it's tended to elevate man. It's tended to elevate man's intellect above that of God. And this inevitably leads to no belief in God, only a strong belief in themselves. Now, in our day we're, we're seeing that in, in the theory of evolution, which, which really tries to do away with God. If we evolve from animals, well, there's no need for God. Worldly wisdom is, is constantly trying to reject God. Constantly trying to oppose Him. Ultimately it shows itself to be foolish and is perishing in doing so. So, Paul asked the rhetorical question. Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? And of course the answer is yes, he has. God did it in Isaiah's day, God did it in Paul's day, and, and God is still doing it in our day. The day is coming when all will praise his holy name. Everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, everything that sets itself up opposed to the revelation of God's word, will be pulled down. In fact, Paul is telling us that all human earthly wisdom of this world is ultimately confounded and frustrated in the person, in the truth of Jesus Christ. He truly is the stumbling block. The human wisdom of philosophers and scholars Judaizers, intellectuals, all of them, all over the world, both in Paul's day and ours, simply cannot understand this wisdom of God. All of human wisdom put together will never lead mankind to the conclusion that Almighty God would, would send His only begotten Son to die on a cross, to to be tortured, to bleed, to be buried and, and to rise again on the third day to, to save such wretched human sinful beings? Human wisdom will not have that. All man-made religion will not have that. God is actually confirming man in his sinful rebellion by choosing something that the wise think is foolish. Making their wisdom foolish. And, and as Roman, Romans tells us, professing themselves to be wise, they are made fools. As fallen mankind leans more on their, their wisdom, the sinful mind of man will never bring itself to the truth of God. It, it, it cannot happen. Verse 21 tells us why. For since in the wisdom God, of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. God's wisdom is not man's wisdom multiplied to the nth degree. It is wisdom of a completely different order. Entirely. Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, said the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, Paul isn't condemning all learning or all education, no. He merely says that by themselves they are useless for obtaining spiritual wisdom. C.H. Spurgeon put it this way. It is certain that a blind man is no judge of colours. A deaf man is no judge of sound. 
And a man who has never been quickened into spiritual life can have no judgment as to spiritual things. T.S. Eliot said in a poem, All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance, and all our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearness to death, no nearer to God. Where is the life we have lost in living? That is where the wisdom of man leads. Death. Death. It's not that man cannot know about God. Romans 1 tells us that we can. Look around. Look at creation. But of course, we're living in days when the wisdom of man now denies creation. In verse 22, Paul expands this assertion and says, For Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jewish standard of what was wise was to be able to see signs. And in Paul's day, the Jewish world, well, they were looking for a massive sign. They specifically wanted the sign of a miraculous messianic deliverance they were not looking for the message of the cross now their desire for deliverance was not bad but their rejection of God's way of deliverance was all wrong one commentator put it like this their idolatry was what they now had God complete Sorry, I'll say that again. Their idolatry was that they now had God completely figured out. He would simply repeat the Exodus in still greater splendour. And the Greeks, well, the Greeks seek after wisdom. The Greek culture valued the pursuit of wisdom. And usually it was expressed in high academic Philosophical terms. They did not value the wisdom expressed in the message of the cross. Again, their desire for wisdom, well, that was not bad, but their rejection of God's wisdom was dreadful. And verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified. Instead of giving the Jews and the Greeks what they demanded in deliverance and wisdom, God gave them something totally unexpected which did not fit with their perceived wisdom. God gave them a crucified Messiah. Christ, Messiah, meant power, splendour, triumph. Crucified. Well, that means weakness, defeat, humiliation. So, preaching Christ crucified was the ultimate oxymoron. And this was exactly what the Apostle Paul preached. Paul didn't Judaize the gospel for the Jews or intellectualize the gospel for the Greek. He preached Christ crucified. I came across this illustration recently. A strong church once inscribed the words, We preach Christ crucified. And it was inscribed on an archway leading into the churchyard. And over time, two things happened. The church lost its passion for Jesus and his gospel, and the ivy began to grow on the archway. The growth of the ivy covering the message showed the spiritual decline. Originally it said, strongly, we preach Christ crucified. But as the ivy grew, one could only read, we preach Christ. And the church also started preaching Jesus the great man, Jesus the moral example, instead of Christ crucified. The ivy kept growing. 
and one could soon only read, we preach. The church also had even lost Jesus in the message, preaching religious platitudes and social graces. Finally, one could only read, we. And the church also just became another social gathering place, all about we and nothing about God. Spurgeon put it well. Certain divines tell us that they must adapt truth to advance to the advance of the age, which means that they must murder it and fling its dead body to the dogs, which simply means that a popular lie shall take the place of an offensive truth. Jesus never diluted the gospel. Jesus never reduced the message to something to suit the wisdom of men. In fact, Jesus presented the gospel as a stumbling block too. And this is something that the church today needs to be reminded of. It's a scandal to the Jew. And to the Greek it is utter foolishness. Verse 24. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. The difference between those rejecting and those accepting the gospel is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Salvation is not the achievement of human wisdom. It is the embrace of God's dramatic, unexpected act of love. Seen at Calvary. The love of God through the Holy Spirit comes and, and touches our understanding. It comes, it, it makes us melt until we no longer see the gospel as, as foolishness but perceive it as the power of God unto salvation. And by the grace of God, by the love of God, we believe. I'm not sure that any Christian can fully understand all of that. Certainly most of us, uh, of us ask, well, why us? Why me? But we do believe it. And we can believe it because of verse 25. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Only God fully understands. But we truly thank God that we can and do fully believe it. And Christian, we shouldn't be afraid to admit that we don't understand everything concerning God. Of course we don't. In fact, it would be rather odd if we did understand everything about an omniscient, omnipotent deity. We must not slip into what some in the Christian church are trying to do. To, to marry Christianity to the world's beliefs. Or the world's value systems. And I say that because that is Really, to exalt man's wisdom over God's wisdom. And really, for the Christian, that should be utter foolishness. Paul now develops his argument in inviting these believers to look at their own experience of what their conversion was. Which brings us to our second difference. The gospel's grace is the opposite of worldly pride. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, look at yourselves. <laughs> You're not a great deal. You're not a great bargain. There were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble among the Christians at Corinth. Now that doesn't mean not any noble 
or any wise people can be saved. History shows us that some noble and some wise have indeed been saved. Lady Huntington, the rich and influential friend of Whitfield and Wesley, said she was going to heaven by an M. She said this, It is not any noble that are called. Instead, it is not many noble. Verses 27 and 28. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. So looking at the Corinthians, Paul can say, you are not wise according to the world, you are not mighty or noble, but you are among the foolish things of the world. Possibly many of the Corinthian Christians were beginning to think of themselves in, well, higher terms because of God's work in them. But Paul won't allow this. They've not been chosen because they are great, far from it. They've been chosen because God is great to put to shame the wise. This explains part of the pleasure of God that is described in verse 21. God loves to rebuke the idolatry of human wisdom. And he often does it by choosing and using the foolish things of the world. Now God isn't saying that it is better to be foolish or uneducated. Rather, he's saying that the world's wisdom, the world's education, does not bring us salvation in Jesus Christ. Calvin put it this way, in putting the strong and wise and great to shame, God does not exalt the weak and uneducated and worthless, but brings all of them down to one common level. Verse 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So the end result is plain. No flesh should glory in God's presence. No one will stand before God and declare, I figured you out. You did it just like I thought you would. God's ways are greater, higher, and nothing of the flesh will glory in his presence. True wisdom belongs to the believing. Verse 30. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Jesus perfectly shows us in his teaching and life God's wisdom. And this wisdom is often in contradiction to man's expectation. True wisdom doesn't have to do with getting smart. God's wisdom is received in and through the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is not only wisdom for us, he is also righteousness, sanctification and redemption. In his work Jesus communicates the these three things to those who are in Christ Jesus. Righteousness. Well, that means that we are legally declared, not only not guilty, but to have a positive righteousness. It means that the righteous deeds and character of Jesus are accounted to us. How incredible is that? We don't become righteous by focusing on ourselves, because Jesus became for us. Righteousness. Sanctification. Sanctification speaks of our behaviour and how the believers are to be separate from the world. We don't grow in sanctification by focusing on ourselves, but, in, but on Jesus, because Jesus became for us sanctification. He is our sanctification. Redemption. Well, that is a word from the slave trade. The idea is that we have been purchased to permanent freedom. We don't find re uh, freedom 
By focusing on ourselves. Because Jesus became for us redemption. It's all of Christ. Purpose of all that is found in verse 31. That as it is written. He who glories. Let him glory in the Lord. Paul uses this reference to Jeremiah 9. To show that God did it all this way. So that God would get the glory. The path of God's glory, Christ crucified. The evidence of God's glory is his choice of the lowly. The third and final difference. The gospel, the gospel's power is the opposite of worldly persuasion. You see, this all affects the way that we present this message. Paul tells us in the first five verses of chapter 2 that this message is not to be presented according to the world's wisdom. If this message is the opposite of worldly wisdom and worldly pride, it must also be the opposite of worldly persuasion. In other words, you don't present this message the way that the world presents its messages. The Corinthians were becoming like those in their day, presenting the message with man-made logic, with argument, with rhetoric. They were more interested in the presentation rather than the message. But Paul is telling them, and of course us, if you're presenting the gospel message, here's the way to do it. Focus centrally and fundamentally on the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Precisely what he said in verse 17 of chapter 1. This is the gospel about the blood of the Lamb. This is about Christ and Him crucified. That's where the power of God is. The cross of Christ. Paul says this is the divine mandate this is the design that I have been given to preach. It is this gospel and no other that saves sinful mankind. Verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. Paul didn't come as a philosopher. He didn't turn up as an entertainer or a salesman. He came as a witness, declaring to you the testimony of God. Now, without doubt, as I'm sure many of you know, the Apostle Paul was a man who could reason, who could debate, persuasively. But he didn't use that approach in preaching the Gospel. He made a conscious decision. I determined to put the emphasis on Christ and Him crucified. Paul was an ambassador. Never a salesman. Now in taking this approach, Paul understood he was not catering to what his audience wanted. Far from it. As someone put it, Corinth put a premium on the veneer of false rhetoric and thin thinking. And of course he already knew very well that the Jews request a sign and Greeks seek after wisdom. But Paul would preach Christ and him crucified. Paul's statement of not to know anything does not mean that he, he left all other knowledge aside, but rather that he had this gospel, he had this important God-given gospel with its crucified Messiah as his singular focus. This was his passion. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. I think all preachers know this a bit. Paul was not brimming with self-confidence. Knowing the need and his own limitations that made him weak, made him afraid. Yet it kept him from the poison of self-reliance. It allowed God's strength to flow through him. These are surely the secrets and the strengths of all preaching. Verse 4, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, Paul knew it is the preacher's job to preach 
But it is the Holy Spirit's job to demonstrate, to say. Paul's preaching may not have been impressive, may not have been persuasive on a human level, but on a spiritual level, and that's what counts, on a spiritual level, level it had truly godly power. Verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Preaching strategies centred around the wisdom of men, around emotion, around entertainment and human personality. They may well yield responses. But they will not yield results for the kingdom of God. Many people use slick, entertaining or even deceptive means to lure people into the church. And justify it by saying, well, we're drawing them in. We're, we're drawing in the, them in and winning them to Jesus. But the principle still stands. What you draw them with is what you draw them to. Paul preaches the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man. Paul preached the cross. He preached the cross because it is the most offensive dimension of the gospel. And friends, we should preach like that. Because the cross of Christ is the power of God unto salvation. It is miraculous. And it is supernatural. Christ crucified is central in all of its magnitude, in all of its simplicity. It is the most effective dimension of the gospel. Let us never forget that. Hallelujah. What a saviour. Amen. I want to close with a hymn, uh, not a hymn writer that I know, <coughs> a hymn writer from the uh, 19th century, J. Wellington Frizzell, what a wonderful name, but he wrote some wonderful words. Cross of Jesus, cross of love, emblem of my King above, cross where Jesus shed his blood, where his love and mercy flowed. Cross of Jesus, cross of peace, where my soul finds sweet release, where he died to set me free, suffered pain and agony. Cross of Jesus, cross of hope, cross on which my Saviour spoke, words of comfort in the hour when he conquered Satan's power. And the refrain is, Blessed cross, oh let me rest Neath thy shadow and be blessed. Blessed cross, oh let me rest Neath thy shadow and be blessed. Let me close with these words. <clears throat> now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel, and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began. But now, made manifest, and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, for obedience to the faith, to God, alone wise, be glory through Jesus Christ forever.